We had one of the discussions today was actually on uh, activated RAF and the difference between that uh, mutated oncogene, activated oncogene and melanoma versus colorectal cancer and how one drug by itself may be very effective in uh, melanoma but not nearly as effective in colorectal cancer but if you add combinations of drugs, you can basically restore the sensitivity and improve the efficacy. So the rewiring, these pathways are important across tumors, but they may be wired different, differently in the different tumors. And by combinations, you can overcome some of the uh, resistance that you see in some type of tissues that you don't see in other tissues. I was going to say that that was one of the themes as well, that as, as much as we saw common pathways, we also saw really uh, specific differences between the different tumors. And I think um, as we go forth, as we gain better understanding about not only differences between cancers, but even within a cancer differences among patients, that's going to influence how we get to precision medicine. Yeah, um, I think that's, you know, a really good question. There have been dramatic changes. I think in the old days, which is five years ago, uh, you did phase one trials where you tried to get a dose and safety. Then you'd move to phase two where you try to see some efficacy. And then you'd combine to do a large randomized phase three trial uh, with a large number of patients. Today we understand the genetics much better. And um, we get tissue from patients to understand their genetic makeup. So phase one, we still need to get a dose and, and safety, and that's important. But we really will sample tissues to make sure the drug uh, is inhibiting the target. And we also are doing some phase ones after we get to a reasonable dose, we get uh, biopsies from patients to say, okay, with this drug, what tumor should we go into? And rather than doing a large phase two, you may say, okay, this genetic defect with a RAF mutant is seen in colorectal cancer, melanoma, and uh, some hematologic tumors. And you might put 10 or 15 patients on a trial within each of those subtypes, set a, uh, uh, some type of uh, endpoint that you want to hit. And frequently in these types of trials, rather than getting one out of 10, you may see four or five out of 10 patients with uh, responses. And so this has completely changed how we do trials. If you see that, you can then go into a large randomized phase two, a single arm trial, or some kind of combo type trial, work with the FDA and go there very much earlier than what you do in the old days. So what I think the goal is, is to see, design your trial so you can know if you have an effective drug or not an effective drug early, do patient tailoring to see which patient should go on the trial, and then do smaller, more rapid trials to really demonstrate the efficacy early on. The final thing I think that's changed a lot is early on to try to do combination trials. For most cancers, one drug will be not sufficient to demonstrate robust efficacy. So we're going earlier on, you want to show that your drug is active, but to combinations very early where you'll inhibit one pathway, plus another potentially resistance pathway, and again, to again, get results earlier and uh, really move the drug uh, development process in a, in a speedier manner. And that's kind of what the breakthrough therapy is all about, is how can you develop regulatory type of um, processes in both review and development working with the FDA so you can move drug approval earlier for these uh, types of diseases where um, the therapies are still, you know, not, uh, not as good as what we would like. Yeah, I'd like to just reinforce exactly what Dr. Gaynor said. I think there's two, two, um, two sides of the coin that we're um, trying to move forward with depending on the situation. One is the situation that Dr. Gaynor um, 
mentioned where uh, if you understand your drug and its target, then you can define the subset of a variety of potentially different cancers that you can target uh, at those early to mid phases of development. Um, the, other, the other approach that we've turned around is to say um, if we have a series of molecules that may be relevant in a particular disease, how can we define within that disease um, uh, the, uh, the patient's profile or characteristics that then target um, a set uh, drug or combination of drugs within that particular disease. So it's two variations on a theme, but it's getting at exactly the point that uh, Dr. Gaynor was making, which is to um, uh, identify early on, uh, to the extent that we can understand the mechanism, how can we exploit that in the clinical situation. We, we, we are in a way that um, uh, is uh, in particular a, a molecule that uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of interest in that uh, targets um, uh, BRAF, which is a, a obviously a critical target that others are looking at as well. We also, in the second example, are just in the um, uh, early discussions to exactly take an opportunity where we have a, a, a series of molecules that uh, have potentially um, uh, focus on uh, a subset of hematologic malignancies, uh, specifically non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, where we're looking at uh, opportunity of how to test those drugs in, in parallel in a single development program. Um, I mean, th those concepts are being definitely discussed uh, among our groups as we're trying to uh, develop our own investigator-initiated clinical trials. I'll point to some of the examples, you know, in the uh, New England Journal in the last year, some of the exciting immunologic um, antibodies that are being developed. What was published was a phase one trial, but that phase one trial had many, many subjects far mm -hmm. beyond what would one would say is a... Um, uh, a traditional path, and I and I think the wisdom of that approach is that you come in saying I have an active agent, and I don't know what is the patient population that's going to be respond that's going to respond. And I think there were a lot of interesting findings and nuggets from those studies that are now the source of interesting studies going forward. So certainly in the academic center, we're looking at that and trying to, and it definitely uh, pushes us to think what are ways that we can accelerate um, how we get from A to Z and, and not necessarily go through the snail's pace that we have traditionally gone at in terms of uh, testing drugs and compounds. So maybe I'll start in that area because I think that um, uh, we talk about old times, but if we talk about ancient times, which is uh, uh, a little bit more than tendencies in the adult world, I think we would all agree that chronic myelogenous leukemia has seen dramatic changes from uh, the landscape before 2000. And what I mean by that is before 2000, uh, the only type of curative therapy that could be uh, offered was allogeneic bone marrow transplant. Uh, and after 2000, we had a drug that could target uh, the oncogene that drives this leukemia and now the p number of patients who uh, are in our transplant boards are not patients with CML. Uh, these drugs, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have extended the lives of these patients with very little toxicity. It spawned the development of many other uh, cousins of that type, type of drug, but more importantly, it's shifted the paradigm of how we think about how we can treat um, blood malignancy. So, if you now think, well, what about five years? That's 10 years ago. Five years ago, I think a lot of the other uh, blood malignancies are trying to follow that paradigm. And if you think now, uh, uh, for example, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, they're trying to find the drug similar to what happened in CML. They're thinking about B cell receptor uh, in, um, signaling inhibitors. And, and a lot of those types of agents have a lot of promise, and people are looking to have the same sort of treatment paradigm shift that has been seen in the myeloid leukemias. There's, you know, there's so many examples, right? Yeah, there it's, really it's are. really a, a, yeah. a great time to be in this field, but I think continuing on the hematologic malignancy front, we obviously have to talk about multiple myeloma, which um, uh, has had slow, steady progress as uh, proteasome inhibitors and uh, 
immunomodulatory therapies have been um, developed successfully and uh, when you look at the survival curves in multiple myeloma over, the, over this period of time, it's, it's, it's pretty dramatic. I also just have to mention non-small cell lung cancer where as we understand the molecular basis of disease, at least for subtypes of, of non-small cell lung cancer and have developed effective therapies there, it's, uh, I think it's, it's truly transformed the way we see a new, uh, newly diagnosed patient. Um, multiple examples we could probably keep yeah. going. I'll mention just one last one. I think we've hit them pretty hard, and that would be melanoma. And when I was practicing, you had melanoma patients. There was like metastatic disease, nothing to do. And now there's two approved therapies, one an immunotherapy and one a small molecule RAF inhibitor for uh, patients with an activating mutation that have really, you know, changed, I think, the landscape. They're not curing people yet, though that you know, maybe they are, at least in some small number, but uh, it's really changed the landscape of a group of patients who didn't respond to anything to now you have options to treat them. PD-1 antibody, PD-L1 antibody, those would be the two that, you know, I'm the most curious about. I would agree totally. <laughs> that, I was exactly going to give that example, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I think also it's really been heartening to see the proof of principle with antibody drug conjugates, and now there are um, um, two very good examples and a, a really a, a new platform that we can exploit across a variety of diseases, I think, really worth noting. And I think we, um, we heard a lot about this uh, t today as well, but I think um, as we understand the, and, and have the tools to exploit the, the cell signaling um, arena, I, I think there's a lot more work to be done both in combination of cell signaling inhibitors, but also in sort of smart uh, application of those with other uh, mechanistic classes and there's just uh, I think I think a, a lot a lot that will chip away with uh, over the next few years there